hear me? Yeah? C'est bon? Okay. Well, welcome everyone for, to our food seminar today. Uh, I have a pleasure of introducing Professor Tyra uh, from UCLA. Uh, professor Tyra is a professor at Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Departments in UCLA. Uh, and uh, he's interested in flow control using data-driven methods and computational methods. Uh, um, so he was, uh, uh, he was uh, also, he held a position previously as an associate professor in uh, Florida State University. And uh, before that, he did his master's and PhD in uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Uh, he has many awards and accolades, so I'm not going to mention all of them. Uh, but uh, some of them include the Young Investigator Award from the Air Force and the Naval Research Center from the U.S. So it's with great pleasure, Sam. Thank you for coming here today. Thank and you. And looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thank you, Tarane, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today. And hopefully, I won't have too many issues with my laptop. But... <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Is this okay? Okay. Okay. So, um, as Tarane said, uh, my research group is interested in flow control, so I'm going to talk a few different approaches. So, uh, before I start, let me sort of give you a big sort of classification on the topics that our research uh, group works on. So, two physical uh, key, key areas that we are interested in is one is unsteady aerodynamics. And the other one is how to control them, so active flow control. And boy, it does keep going in and out. Can I switch maybe to a different connector? Yes. So sorry. Let me try the other one. Let's see if I can get this going quickly. Thank you, sir. Oh, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Serena. <laughs> yeah, well, no, 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 no. That was my bad. Okay, so hopefully this will stay. Okay, so uh, unsteady dynamics, active flow control, and we will sort of use any kind of technique that we can get our hands on to solve this problem. So that means uh, stability analysis, model analysis, network science, uh, machine learning, and we also work with a lot of computational methods. Now, this research endeavor wouldn't have been possible without a lot of our collaborators and our students. So you see a lot of our name uh, or students' names on the top, and also our collaborators. Some have already graduated, and since become faculty members. Okay, and also we were very thankful for a lot of the sponsors uh, that has supported their our efforts. Now, today I'm going to talk a lot about different topics. I had no idea how to put them cohesively together, but I do know that uh, I'm Japanese. The Japanese and the French have something in common, and that's their love of food. So. This is the approach that I'm going to take today. So I'm going to give you a menu or research menu as to, well, you know, different bits and flavors uh, of t research topics. And I think it's appropriate that I do this because it's right before lunch. Okay, so let me start with the motivation as to why we're doing this type of work. Now, the motivation is that we're really interested in looking at unsteady flows. So let's talk about maybe this particular example. Uh, an airplane is trying to land on a ship, an aircraft carrier. Now, it looks quite nice. It's on a sunny day. The weather is calm. But it's actually landing in the wake of the ship. So these superstructures are generating a tremendous amount of vertical wake, and it's trying to land in it. If the weather is bad, you can imagine this is a challenge. And if you're trying to do this with no navigational support, it's an aerodynamic sort of a nightmare sometimes. You can also think of a plane landing vertically, and now the angle of attack is 90 degrees with respect to the wing, and you're also getting this large ground effect from vertical forces or vertical effects, right? Now, we do have hope that biology seems to have a way of nicely flying, right? Even in super gusty conditions and stably uh, achieving flight, right? And that could have some key insights or implications as to how we might be able to enhance the operational capabilities of aircraft, right? And just to show you this image, this looks quite nice, but if you think of a really windy situation in an urban uh, environment, the size of the vortex behind these buildings 
could be the size of this vehicle itself. So you can imagine flying in those conditions is really challenging. So this is where flow control for us comes into play is to try to see if we can stabilize the behavior of flow against really some flying machine, right? Now the challenges here is, as you all know, that the flow is nonlinear and it's high dimensional. So if you have a turbulent flow like this, this is a simulation of flow over a hump, right? Think of an inverted wing. You can kind of pull out some large structures, but you can't get everything, right? So how do you control this, right? So we're gonna talk a lot about this. And um, we're gonna take a lot of sort of insights uh, from physics, but what we're gonna really take advantage of this computational power and some of the advanced techniques that we're seeing from math. So this is my biased starting point, the view of the starting point, okay? So I'm from computational science or CFD, so I'm gonna take the approach that we have the governing equation, the Navier-Stokes equation ready for us to use, and we have fairly mature set of CFD solvers ready for us, okay? I know there are some problems that we still can't solve, but we're gonna start with the fact that we have some solvers that we can rely on. Now with that in mind, we also have lots of data that we can take advantage of. Okay, we're gonna talk about that today. And we also have operators that we can take advantage of. So from all these collections of insights, we're gonna try to address, well, how can we take advantage of it and control the flow? And we have to be kind of mindful of this, right? We're at the point where we have sort of a, a tsunami of data, right? You have, well, I, I think Tarana, you can agree too that we keep buying hard drives on research grants. We keep buying hard drives. Students say we want more hard drives. Now it's questionable that we actually look at all the data on these hard drives, right? But we want to do this in a much smarter way, how to use the data to our advantage. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this data that we're talking about for fluid mechanics. We're in a unique research area where data is huge, right? So I'm going to give you an example of a linearized Navier-Stokes equation where you have Q dot is equal to L times Q. L is your linearized Navier-Stokes operator. Q is your state variable. It could be like the flow field, right? Velocity field. The dimension of Q in CFD is the number of grid points times the number of unknown variables, right? So that could be really huge. I'm writing right here 1 million, but it could definitely be a lot larger than 1 million, right? Now, all the stuff that we learn in theory in our homework problems, in our classes, are like this size, right? We can do it on MATLAB. You can do it on any kind of library what, whatsoever, right, on your laptop. The issue is that I lied here. I made this graph on a log scale. What it really is that you're solving for homework problems on a dot or something that's smaller than a pixel on this screen, okay? So the idea here is if you wanna take something that you learn in this size up to here, how do you go about it? You have to be able to reduce the dimension first before you can talk about modeling, analysis, or control, okay? So do we have hope? We do, because if you look at physics, Right, this is an image of the cloud formation over an island taken from the space shuttle. The Reynolds number is really high, but you can see some features here. And for those of you who are in fluids, you can make an association that this is just like the von Karman wake, right? And this is the Reynolds number 100. This is laminar flow. But if you can make the correspondence between the two, there are a lot of insights that you can extract from one flow versus another, and then hopefully understand the physics. Now, why am I really excited? I might sound really excited because I had four espresso shots this morning. That's one reason too, but I'm really excited because I can't think of a better time to start getting into this field, into data science and fluid mechanics because data science is exploding like crazy, like as, as you all know, right? There are lots of good books that are coming out and there's some really good ideas that are coming out that wouldn't have been possible, say 10, 15 years ago. And that's thanks to the fact that hardware is getting better and better, and also the fact that libraries that solves a lot of the optimization problems are getting really, really available, okay? And just to give you a kind of a fun fact, DOE calls these ultra-modern data analysis tools. I've never seen that word, but kind of sounds cool, okay? All right, so that's the motivation. So let me see if I can get to some of the details as to how we go about flow control. So now I'm going to the next dish. I'm gonna change the topic a little bit. Okay, so 
I'm going to show you this flow. We have a flow over an airfoil at a fairly modest Reynolds number. I'll explain the details later. But traditionally, what we have been doing is you get this kind of flow. We want to do some control effect. We do trial and error. We go through lots of simulations and try to figure out which one's the best. You can do this. The only issue, well, not the only issue, but the major issue is it's expensive. Okay? Computations are expensive. Experiments are also expensive. It takes human power, resources, and time. So what we want to do here is to come up with a way to have an alternative guidance that would give us some ideas about how to narrow down the parameter space that we should look for. Now, I'll explain this a bit more in detail. So I'm going to take this example problem where we have flow over a NACA 0012 airfoil, spanwise periodic. It's turbulent, Mach numbers at 0.3. It's simulated using Charles. And what we're going to do is we're going to place some actuators near the leading edge, near the separation point, and we're going to in consider initially what we call the heat flux actuator. This was done at the request of the US Army to consider whether it's useful or not. It comes from what we call the thermoacoustics so acoustics actuator, um, which puts AC current over a thin graphene membrane. These are so thin that you can see through it. But when you put AC current through it, it makes a lot of noise and it generates heat. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in heat uh, in the falling format, right? So you have some frequency, some amplitude, and some spanwise wave number. So think of this as a, some arrangement of actuators in the spanwise direction. And what we want to consider is the optimal way to figure out optimal combination of the wave number, the frequency, okay? And we're going to later talk about how to figure out what the actuation direction is and the type of actuation. Right now, we fixed it with the heat flux actuator, but we're going to revisit that later, okay? And we're going to revisit these two things. Now, the only thing that I can't answer yet is the actuation amplitude, okay? But we can talk about this a bit more later if we need to. Okay, so that's the problem that we're going to solve. We're going to find the optimal setup to change the behavior of the flow, hopefully lift enhancement, drag reduction. This is sort of a movie of what you can do. At this point, we haven't optimized anything. This is the baseline flow. All of these are started with the same initial condition. You're plotting the Q criteria with the streamwise velocity pro of in, in color. If you have a 2D control, so what you're doing is you're kind of chopping up these shear layers in some nice ways and it generates these organized streamwise vortices and the flow becomes 2D, which is really interesting, right? Because the, the vortices are now really organized. If you put in three-dimensional control with spanwise variation, you trigger some instability early on that enhances three-dimensional mixing and causes the vortices to break down much earlier and hence you recover some nice things about the separate over the separated flow. You uh, induce better uh, reattachment. Both of these cases reduce drag and lift is increased in this case, although it's not that great, 5% increase, okay? All right, but we don't wanna do this again, right? This is kind of an expensive endeavor. So what we're gonna resort to is sort of a resolvent-based approach. So we're going to linearize the Navier-Stokes equation about some base state. So the, the state variable Q is decomposed into some base state plus perturbation. You can take the base state to be the equilibrium point, the solution to the Navier-Stokes, that's time invariant. Or in our case, we're going to consider it to be the time average flow field for turbulent flow. Okay? You can linearize it. What we're going to do in our case is we're going to linearize about the time average state and take all the residual and stick it into F prime and consider that to be the forcing into the flow. And we can do this assuming that F prime is statistically stationary in time. Okay, so harmonic input. We're gonna assume that both of these are harmonic variables, which means you get a sine wave coming in, sine wave going out, so input is F, Q is the output in some sense. If you stick these expressions into this equation, if you don't have the forcing, right, it will give you the usual global stability analysis problem that you can solve using the eigenvalue formulation, okay? If you do include this F, 
you'll get the following equation, which is q hat is, is equal to the inverse of i omega identity minus L, this linearized Navier-Stokes operator, f hat. This is essentially the transfer function that you'll see in dynamical systems. This operator is called the resolvent. And this is the basis for resolvent analysis. This is what we're going to use. And what we're going to use here is in this f, we're going to stick in the time average flow over the airflow. Now, what does this mean? So we'll go back to this resolvent formulation. So you have the forcing input f hat and q hat. These are functions of x. And you could do this analysis for each frequency. So you have input coming in, harmonic, and you'll get the output, right? Now what you'll do is you'll take this resolvent, which is kind of a matrix like this. It's big. There's an inverse, so you might think we're taking an inverse, but in actual implementation, you don't need to take the inverse, so we're good, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to do the SVD of this operator. So what you're going to get is the right, you're going to get the right singular vectors and the left singular vectors, and you're going to get the singular values. And they, it could be in decreasing order. What this tells you is that if you look at the dominant one, the primary one, the first one, this is the forcing mode that will give some amplification, and this is the response of the system, okay? So this is like the most dangerous way to excite the system in a harmonic manner. And you can get this for a second mode and the third mode, but you'll get the pair of these forcing and response for each frequency, okay? So this means if I wanna know how to excite the system in the optimal way, I can do this SVD and figure out what kind of profile I should be providing, okay? Now, here, from resolvent analysis, like I said, the frequency I can change, so I'm changing the frequency, I'm reporting it in terms of Struhl number. I can also change the span wise wave number. So this is the 2D modes. I can see the forcing mode, and I'll see the response mode, okay? In addition to all this, I can also get the singular value distribu uh, distribution, right? So here is the frequency, here is the wave number, this is the 3D now and I can get this profile. Seems great, but there's a bit of a question that we should be thinking about is, I wanna change the base flow. I provided the base flow, I'm doing the analysis, but I really wanna change the base flow. In order to do that, I need some nonlinear mechanism to change the base flow, right? I need to change lift or drag. For that, I need the base flow to change. So what you could do is now think of how you can depart from linear analysis, right? So what you're going to do, or what we did, was we took the primary modes, the response side, and then figured out what the Reynolds stress is over the wing so that we can now think of how you can depart away from the base flow that you currently have, right? These are the Reynolds stress distribution for some representative C uh, Struhl number and spanwise wave number. Then when we went a little further, we said, well, can we find sort of a guidance for control? And in order to do that, we said, well, why don't we integrate how likely we're gonna get these changes to appear, right? So what we did was we integrated over a certain window over the wing, okay? And we evaluated that as M, some metric, design metric, right, for flow control. And you can get this distribution for frequency and wave numbers. Now, this is enhancing mixing in some sense, this Reynolds stress over the wing, which we know is going to reattach the flow, right? So here's kind of the solution that we got. Now, these data points, each of them were pretty expensive simulations, LES, because what we really need to do is to put in the chosen control parameters, Struhl number, and these are for different wave numbers. You get one data point after waiting for a few days, right? But what we can get is this metric M without doing the simulation. So we can say for the combination of Struhl number and wave number, what are the M value, the metric, the mixing metric M that we'll get. Now we plotted that color on top of actual data, right? So you'll see that for certain cases where they have high value of M, the CD has gone down significantly, lift has gone down upwards, right? Increased quite a bit and you get the lift to drag ratio to be pretty high. Now, it's not perfect, but what it allows us to do is to restrict where we need to search over the parameter space. 
Now we can go back and look at what the LES results actually look like. And you know, we have tons of cases like this, right? Because we actually ran the, the expensive trial error as well, thanks to the Department of Defense providing us with computer time. But these are the cases that are identified through resolvent analysis to be really promising. And if you indeed look at it, CD is now close to, in some cases, 50% reduction and CO is up by almost 50% in some cases. So we're pretty happy about this. So without having to go through the full range of resolvent analysis, we can now apply this to do flow control, right? Now you could say, well, this is an ACO 0012. This is a pretty simple case. True, but I'm happy to report that we're actually doing this kind of analysis on a full vehicle. When I say vehicle, car, okay? And it seems to be doing pretty good, okay? All right, now this is kind of neat but there's something that's kind of bugging me. So let me talk to you on a, on a lighter side of research. Some really cool idea. So let's go back to the SVD, right? The matrix we had to deal with, the resolvent, think of this as the resolvent operator. It's huge. But what we get in return is actually kind of light, right? It seems ridiculous. We get all this matrix and what we want in return is just a pair of uh, vectors and a singular value. So we should be able to do something better than that, right? So here's an idea that comes from the data science community called the uh, numerical or randomized numerical linear algebra. To give you some idea, what you can do is you can, instead of doing the full SVD, you can use what's called sketching. Now the sketching is really cool. This is something that Peter and I are kind of working on together. And what you can do is you can use what's called a test matrix. This test matrix is tall and skinny, almost like a vector, but it has some width to it. And you just generate it to be a random matrix, okay? You really, in MATLAB, you can just type rand, and this is it. K is the width of this uh, matrix. You multiply it to this large matrix A, and you'll get what's called a sketch Y. So the Y is called a sketch. Y should hold key information about the action of A on some random vector, right? So it should have some information about A, the action of A on it. Now, what's exciting here is that instead of doing the SVD on this full A, you can reduce this big matrix and come up with a low rank approximation B, okay? I skipped a few steps, but you can actually get a much smaller, thinner B, right? A flatter B. If you do an SVD on it, it, reta excuse me, it retains property of A, and you can reconstruct what the singular vectors are later, okay? Now, this idea is not something new. It's been actually applied to POD, DMD. We apply the resolve analysis and network characterization. It works really well, okay? Just to give you an idea, I've already shown some of these results earlier. This is from the full resolve analysis. If we use k equals 10, so just really skinny matrix, test matrix, and do the randomized resolvent analysis, you'll get these results. And it's much faster, of course, and you can't really see the difference between the two approaches. Now, I won't go into the detail here, but I'm happy to say that if you incorporate physics into this, you can actually just pass two vectors, k equals two, and get the identical results. Now, what's even crazier is if you do it the right way, you can actually pass one vector and get the same results too. Now, you might say, Sam, that's kind of nice. What does this mean? It means that we can actually push the limit on resolve analysis to much more complex flow field because we can get to handle bigger matrices, right? So we actually got data from the Air Force, the US Air Force, for Reynolds number half a million. This is what the flow field looks like. This is actual instantaneous flow field. And we analyze the time errors flow field for this, and we get intricate structures near the leading edge from this resolvent analysis. And K is five in this case. It's a really short and skinny test matrix. And here, what the kind of insights that we get is we can see that the response mode and the forcing modes have certain areas where they're supported, and depending on the frequency, that you can see is how they overlap, which kind of has some implications for things such as wave makers, right, which are important for flow control. Now, so far I've been telling you how to do resolvent analysis for certain types of, uh, well, 
I haven't really told you about the, how to choose the actuator or the direction, right? So the next topic is kind of interesting. This is something that we worked with Callum and Peter, right? We can change the analysis from an L2 based analysis to a sparsity promoting mode or node or norm based analysis, okay? So you switch to L1. And if you do this analysis, you have to actually switch to an optimization type formulation. But here's what you would get from L2, right? You get this global distribution of modes, right? So this is the forcey mode. It says, well, force around here, but that doesn't really help us because it's not a point. In experiments, you actually want the actuator to be a point, right? If you switch to L1, we're happy to say you can now reduce it to a point because it's sparsely promoting. Here, we didn't really restrict the modes to be resident on the surface, but you can even constrain it so that it's on the surface. Okay, that's even better. But what was even nicer was it's sparsely promoting also in the variable. So the dashed lines are what you would get traditionally from L2, but if you look at the sparsely promoting mode, the these or the star symbols that you would get. And what this is telling us is that, well, we should really rely on, instead of thermal actuation that I talked about earlier, we should really rely on rho u prime and rho v prime. So we need to get something like a momentum-based actuation mechanism here. And because we know rho u and rho v, it, tell us, it tells us the direction of actuation as well. So the variable and the direction can be obtained from this type of formulation, okay? All right, so I talked to you about how to do the modal stuff, right? I'm gonna now switch gears and talk about how you can possibly do data-driven control, okay? So now this is gonna be a bit heavy. So I'll, I'll try to go through this, but you know, change the topic here. Now, let me talk about clustering in general first. So if I give you a lot of data, there are ways to pull out like a community of data, right? So some of you might know this. This is actually uh, an example of k-means clustering. So here I have a two-dimensional example and with our eyes are great tools, right? You can actually pull out some features here. You could argue that there might be one and another cluster here that would give you this result. Or if you wanna go more aggressive, you can actually probably see that there's two more subgroups right there that you can pull out. So you can actually define three groups, right? And these black squares are the center of those clusters, right? You can imagine then maybe you can collapse these data into three points and do some interesting analysis. This is what the basis of what I'm gonna do next, okay? So here, let's revisit the same problem, okay? where we have separated flow over an airfoil. And now our idea is going to be, can I do adaptive control to change the behavior of this flow? Okay, so I'm gonna change uh, the actuation mechanism slightly. And now it's gonna be blowing in suction, okay? But we're gonna try to do this in an adaptive manner, okay? In response to how the flow field is gonna be evolving. All right, so how am I gonna do clustering or how am I gonna use clustering here, right? Here, what we're gonna do is to identify the dynamical behavior of the flow. We're gonna take lift, the time rate of change of lift, and drag, okay? We're gonna generate a three axis system and plot the time history of these three signals in what we call the feature space. Once we get into this feature space, we're gonna then cluster the data. Here we cluster into 10 communities or data sets. And then we're going to come up with cl uh, cluster centroids. So we're going to collapse all that data into the centroids of the data set. And what you can do from this formulation is now you can say, well, how likely am I during this dynamical process to go from one community to another? Can we assess it? Okay. And you can represent that using what we call a probability transition matrix. And this probability transition matrix tells you like, for example, if I'm currently in, let's say, cluster five, okay, then I have a chance of going next to cluster one, four, or six. You can actually stay in five, but I'm not plotting that here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm removing the diagonal, but I have a chance of going to one, four, or six, with six being the highest probability. Right? So I can do this for all of it. This is just really counting, really, okay? Once I have that information, then I can show a network of how likely I'm gonna go from one cluster to another. 
So this is what I would call kind of like this airline network, where I have lots of airports, which are actually cluster centroids, and the thickness of these lines are representing how likely I am to go from one cluster to another. Okay? Now, what Aditya did, who worked on this project, was pretty clever. He went from low drag all the way to high drag. He arranged it that way, okay? And he's showing some representative flow field. Now, the question is, well, if I don't want to be in a high drag state, because I want lower drag, perhaps, I don't want to be here. Nine or 10 are the high drag states. What do I need to do? What I would actually need to do is to find ways not to get here, right? So to get here, you actually need to be at seven, right? Seven actually has arrows pointing to it, so you don't want to be at seven. Now, if you don't want to be at seven, you can actually figure out that you don't want to be at eight, you don't want to be at six, right? If I avoid going to six, seconds, you can actually avoid going to eight. And if you look even carefully, you can actually figure out that if I don't want, if I can avoid going to three, you can actually kill this whole path, okay? Now, that seems interesting, but you can actually formulate this process a little bit more automatically. So what you can do is you can say, well, what is the actual control input that you would want to put in at the leading edge of the actual uh, the wing, right? So that you would minimize the towing power and penalize the actuation power, okay? And you can go through an optimization process using simplex method to minimize this class function and figure out what the right forcing input should be at the leading edge. So one, as you're going through this whole dynamical system and going through this cluster, you can figure out how to blow and suck at the right amount. And if you do so, you can change the behavior of that network. So now you can push everything to this side to the controlled flow, okay? So this is something that we were happy about. Now, one thing that's interesting is that with control, we never said that you should be removing separation. You should be reattaching the flow. We never said that. We just said minimize towing power. So the result that we got was some interesting flow feature, right, where you still have separation towards the back of the wing, the trailing edge, but drag is minimized tremendously. What's interesting is that there's also a, a very extensive experimental campaign that was performed by uh, Miki Amite and Ari Glazer, and they achieved similar drag reduction. So we achieved about 11 to 17%. Those are similar amounts of drag reduction that we were able to achieve. But we didn't have to do a, a lot of campaign. We just ran through the optimization routine, okay? Now, so that was the data-driven approach. And now that was all adaptive, but still, in some sense, open loop, right? So now I'm going to talk about how we want to go from getting some data and then trying to close the loop later. But here is our attempt. So let me start to deviate away to the world of machine learning, okay? And figure out uh, whether this is going to be interesting. So let me motivate you guys with the following question. Our eyes are really good machines, but we're, we're actually pretty good, smart machines, okay? Now, if I tell you that this is the vorticity field, and this comes from 2D isotropic turbulence, my question is going to be, well, can you identify where the vortices are? It's probably not that difficult. You can probably identify that that's a vortex. This is a vortex. That's a vortex. That's a vortex. In fact, these are vortex pairs. These are vortex pairs. There are probably vortices here and here because we've seen it. We've seen it before, right? This is probably not that hard. In fact, the solution looks like this, okay? So not that surprising, right? Now, can we ask a machine to do it? This is not a new concept. It's actually been done in a different field quite a bit. So this is called super resolution analysis, okay? For those of you who know, Kai is doing this, right? And for example, Google has been putting in lots of effort into reconstructing a low resolution image to get a higher resolution image okay, in an accurate manner. The traditional approach has been to do interpolation. The now going beyond interpolation, the newer approach, the modern approach is to use machine learning to reconstruct a flow field, or in this case, an image. So what we did was we tried to do this for, flow con uh, for fluid flows. So here, what you would need to do is to come up with a model or a function f that would take the low resolution input, x, 
and then try to match y, the reference data, the solution. So you want to minimize the difference between these two. And what you need to do is to tune some parameter or set of parameters, w, weights. Right? So in neural networks, those are the weights that you would want to sort of adjust. Okay? These are actual examples that we considered for flow over a cylinder. This is the res re low resolution input that we put in. This is what we wanted to reconstruct. This is what we actually got. Okay? So it looks pretty good. Now to give you some idea about what we actually had to do, we didn't do this standard CNN, the convolutional neural network. We actually had to embed some ideas about how the flow field behaves, especially for 2D turbulence. For example, we wanted to get um, scale invariance, rotational invariance, all these nice properties about turbulence. So we have some s connections that are skipped so you can have some communication between scales. But if you do so, the results are fantastic. Okay, as if you can put in some physical insights into the construction of neural network, it works pretty well. So here are some nice highlights of the results. So the input is this, either 16 by 16, 8 by 8, or 4 by 4 images, okay, so that we can reconstruct a 128 by 128 flow field. Okay, now let me show you the interpolation. This is the standard reconstruction technique, the old one. It looks pretty good for 16 by 16. The numbers underneath are the L2 error norms, okay? By the time you go to f eight by eight, uh, it's starting to become very blurry, okay? We originally stopped right here and said, okay, we're done. It looks pretty bad. Well, our collaborator, Professor Fukugara says, well, why don't we abuse this, right? We went to four by four, of course we get nothing. Now you probably can guess what's gonna happen with machine learning. With 16 by 16, you can, of course, get a pretty crisp image. 8 by 8, still so. 4 by 4, you can still pull out features, which is kind of amazing, right? I, I wouldn't have imagined this would work. But there's something in the flow field that says 16 data points are enough to reconstruct something like this that would resemble the reference flow field. Now, it's not perfect, I admit, but you can pull out features now, okay? And sometimes that's useful for us in fluid mechanics, right? Now the concept can be extended to 3D. So here we discretize this kind of, well, this is channel flow, turbulent channel flow, with eight times three times eight points. Not a lot of points. Here's a slice right here. And there is the real solution. This is the input to the system and you can reconstruct it. I forgot to tell you, but the amount of snapshots that we would have to provide to train this is not a lot. Usually it's on the order of hundreds. Sometimes you can go down all the way to 50 and still achieve something pretty nice. Now for 3D, we have to have some, done something in the order of hundreds, but you can nonetheless reconstruct the flow. You can reconstruct the flow even in 3D, okay? Now you might be wondering, well, Sam, this is great, but you know, we're not dealing with images all the time. This idea uh, about the images is not just restricted to images. We're we can think of these pixels being sensor inputs, right? Sensor points. So if I can replace sensor data, right, for these pixels, then I can reconstruct the flow from limited amount of information that you would get sparse measurements, right? Now that's the next topic here. Now I can have sensors, inputs, sensors one to eight in this example at different locations, now non-uniformly or randomly chosen in this case, to reconstruct flow over a cylinder. It turns out you can supplement the sensor information with what we call the Voronoi image. So Voronoi tessellation image. If you do so, these sensors can be moving in time. They could change the number. You could have eight, you can have seven, you can have six, you have 100 if you want. If you train it the right way, you can come up with one model. You don't have to retrain again and again. You can have one model and one model only to reconstruct the flow. What that means is that we can reconstruct something like flow, or this is the sea surface temperature distribution taken by satellites from NOAA. We were able to do machine learning reconstruction of this type of distribution or global flow from very limited number of uh, sensors. I think this was about 40 or 50 sensors that identified by yellow dots. If you do linear or cubic interpolation, you just can't get it but now we're able to do it. And you can even change the sense location. So this will be useful, for example, if you have buoys moving around or if you have particles in the flow field, right? 
with this kind of information, we're kind of hopeful that we can actually get situational awareness of the flow field so that we can use it for flow control. We're not there yet, but we're just kind of preparing the tool sets. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna start to conclude the talk, okay? Now, I think data science and machine learning uh, offering really refreshing approaches, right? Uh, to tackle some of the really data intensive, intensive problems that we have that's coming from turbulence, right? Um, and I'm hopeful that we can use that for flow control efforts. Uh, let's see. And I'll, I'll mention this again. So a lot of people ask, well, is this new? I think it's new because about a decade ago, we weren't able to do these things. So we now have a lot of computer power that's significant, readily available, and the optimization libraries were not available 10 years ago. Now we have access to them. Okay, now, they're not magical solutions to solve all problems. Right? So we have to know the limitations, right? And we have to be able to use them carefully. So we do need to train ourselves as to how to use these tools, okay? Um, now, I did not talk about time varying base states today, but now our group is working towards changing the base states to be time varying. So stay tuned if you're interested. Um, with that, I'd like to thank our students, postdoc and sponsors uh, for supporting this effort. And thank you, Tarani, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And um, I hope I didn't give you indigestion, <laughs> but I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. question from sure so I thought this um, randomized uh, numerical this, this is amazing You're right. uh, so one question I had was that uh, do you have to because one the main problem we have in the large code is creating the operators because right. we don't have access to the actual full operator at all so to create this little rows of uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, B matrix, yes. do you still need the, op uh, the operator or you need the operation of the operator? You need the operation of the operator. So you don't have to formally make the operator at yeah. all. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty yeah. good. Now sometimes, depending on the kind of algorithm, you, you might need the adjoint. Ah. So mm -hmm. you might have to get a transpose, but you, know, you don't necessarily need to save the operator. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, well, that's, that's very handy. That's, that is handy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, just one more question. Sure. sure. I'm hogging now. Okay. Uh, so uh, another thing I wanted to ask you was that for in betweening and for the super resolution stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, does that you mentioned that you need about a hundred snapshots for training? Order hundreds. Yeah. That's pretty low, based on. It is. I so I think this is something. Sorry. I, I hope I'm not interrupting your question. No. But, um, so this is kind of my perspective, so I can't prove this yet, mm -hmm. is that fluid flow data sets are very rich. Even a single snapshot contains a lot of information mm -hmm. as opposed to, let's say, what the data science community might commonly mm -hmm. handle for, let's say, image processing. So it's not just a single human face. We have vortices all over the flow field. Yeah. So if that's something you wanna learn, you might have a single snapshot with, with 10 vortices instead of 10 faces, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, the data is already rich. So it m you might say, well, it's only 100 snapshots, but that might be 100 times n times n vortices. Right. Yeah. If that's the case, you know, we can do a, f you know, a simple comparison of how many facial images you have versus how many snapshots you have. It's actually, you, we have to have a different way of quantifying it. I see, yeah. That, yeah. No, no, that makes a lot of sense because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, but if, uh, is that because uh, uh, what the type of data I saw is the channel flow yep. that uh, you, uh, mm -hmm. as a 3D data, yes. right? So if you have something that is spatially evolving or there mm -hmm. are things that are appearing in the middle, yep. would you s expect that you would need more information that's that's probably true because there is some symmetry i mean tr that uh, channel flow data was periodic in, in yeah. the streamwise direction right but if you don't have that assumption that you you might have to have a bit more data to make sure that you can get the okay. growth profile correctly right so you're you're probably right i think you you would need a little bit more data compared to channel flow well i i want to talk to you about that okay, okay. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure good well are there any other questions ah Thank um, you. Have you tried to control unsteady flow in the process of uh, shock waves, like uh, buffeting flows? 
Have I? Did um, you try to control such We rules? have not. So our group, we just had this discussion. I, my group tends to work in the low speed community. <laughs> um, so we haven't really seen much of high speed flows. We haven't dealt with shocks. Yeah. Um, the only applications that we have been dealing with is flow over a cavity at transonic conditions. But mm -hmm. our, our, our efforts have focused on changing the shear layer physics so that the shock waves that appear over the cavity are reduced. Now, in those cases, we can make it work. Some of these approaches do work. But we haven't dealt with like buffeting. Uh, yeah, for you have the no moment. idea uh, what kind of issue you can expect to deal with uh, such flows um, with your methods. So I think in principle, a lot of these approaches would work. But just because I haven't dealt with buffeting uh, extensively, I wouldn't know. The, if you can alleviate the dominant feature of buffeting, and if that doesn't generate something secondary or something that's at a slightly different frequency and just can't get rid of it, I might uh, I suspect that that's an issue that might be challenging, but I, I couldn't tell without trying it, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have two, qu two questions. The first one is how What's the amplitude of the perturbation that you impose uh, relative to the base flow uh, in order to have control? So and this was for the, the separation control? Yep. OK. Let me see if I can find it. So So the amplitude of actuation was actually chosen to be similar to the amplitude of what's being used by plasma actuation. Okay. So we control the non-dimensional energy, which in this case is like 0.09, if that means anything. And then my second question is, if, if you go to um, unsteady flow, mm -hmm. um, would you expect to have different clustering? So in your, you, know, you, had, you had something like 10 states? Yes. I mean, it, between which you would go to? And and so, would you ex did you ex do you expect to transition from I mean ten states to fifteen and so on and have different clustering each time and so on? That's a wonderful question. So let let me see if I can sort of give you a prelude to what we would have to do. Nice. So, in general, maybe this is a better slide. This still works for unsteady flows, right? Because if your data, if your tra trajectory lies in this big ball of data, we know how to deal with it. This, this kind of has this ad adaptive control mechanism that you can take advantage of. Now the big question becomes, well, you change the base plate so much and your flow or your dynamics starts to become out, go outside of this ball, then you would have to adaptively cluster the new set of data. And you're right, it becomes then 10 clusters, it will become 15 clusters, it could become 20. So, but the basic concept is already there, right? So it should work. Now, this doesn't really talk about modes and amplitudes and all that, but the basic idea is that we have to go away from just looking at amplitudes, we have to look at the phase. And the general description of phase is something we have to work on, and that's something we're spending some efforts into. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. No more questions? Um, let's thank Great. our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.